Hello aspirants, looking at current affairs for 27th March, the news items picked up from the Hindu newspaper are these 16, we will look at them in detail. The first one, Indo-US civil nuclear pact likely to miss June deadline. So Indo-US nuclear deal which got initiated in 2005 when then Prime Minister of India Manmohan Singh and then President of USA George W. Bush had initiated this procedure. And post that, in 2008, the civil nuclear deal negotiations were finalized too. And even two years, around two years ago, the, it was also announced that civil nuclear deal is completely done. But still, we see that operationalization has not taken place. Means there has been no nuclear reactor installed by US companies in India. So that's what sale nuclear deal means. It's making arrangements that nuclear transfer or trade can take place between the two countries. So that has not taken place because the Westinghouse, this company from USA, is now owned by Toshiba, a company from Japan. And the critical equipments, critical components of this Westinghouse nuclear reactors are from. Japanese origin. So that is why as long as India-Japan uh, nuclear deal is not finalized, this transit trade cannot take place. So that's what the whole thing is stuck on. And India-Japan nuclear deal is stuck because presently there is a scandal in which the Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, uh, uh, is involved because of which the parliament is stalled there. The parliament of Japan is called Diet. So diet is not functioning, it's stuck on that one issue and it is demanding action to be taken. That is why no laws are being passed and this India-Japan nuclear deal is also not being finalized by the diet. So that is what is uh, uh, waiting to be done now because executive has finalized it but the parliament, legislature also has to finalize it, the diet. So that is also stuck. Plus, there's another news that Westinghouse is going bankrupt. So, it is going to file for bankruptcy too. So, that is also going to make it difficult for the MOU which has been planned that six nuclear reactors will be built by this Toshiba owned Westinghouse in Andhra Pradesh. So, that is the concern. Toshiba also we have seen earlier it had come in news that it does not want to build any more new plants here in Asia. So, that's why all this deal is also under stress. So what would happen, we'll have to wait and watch. Even another MOU which is there is with GE. So GE, the company from US again, there also it had faced problem in setting up its nuclear plant in Mithivirdi in Gujarat. So it has also been shifted to Andhra Pradesh now. So there are complications here. The, the operationalization eventually has not taken place. So that is the whole issue. Also, of course, the Nuclear Liability Act of 2010 of India was also a concern. On that also negotiations took place and that's what was in news that Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and then President of USA Barack Obama, they met and they finalized these obstacles too with respect to Nuclear Liability Agreement. So, this Nuclear Liability Act of 2010 of India, that makes provisions that there are two points actually on which these international other countries have problems. Means these international companies would have problems. So this is clause 17b of this uh, uh, Nuclear Liability Act which says that operator has the right to recourse against supplier in case of nuclear accident. So if there is a nuclear accident then who is liable? That's the whole uh, act all about. So operator, operator in all these cases will be NPCIL majorly. So presently that is what is understood. NPCIL is a peer, public sector. So that is the operator. So it has a right to recourse against supplier. So supplier of the nuclear reactor equipments etc they can be held liable for any nuclear accident so this is one clause and clause 46 in nuclear liability act of 2008 2010 says that the it makes the supplier liable under other indian laws also so we will be liable under indian laws so that is also a concern so on this india usa had negotiations and it was worked through so now that is not the sticking point in operationalization but other two issues are comforts of Japan and of bankruptcy of Westinghouse. So this is the, what the whole thing is all about. Then the next news item is Pakistan detains 100 Indian fishermen. So this is after Indian Coast Guard detained 9 Pakistani nationals, seized their fishing boats. The same thing has been done by Pakistan Maritime Security Agency now. So this again the stress between India and Pakistan is highlighted here. So there is the international maritime boundary line So in international waters. So here the crossing over had taken place by these fishermen because of which they have been apprehended. 
Then the next news item is Rajnath reviews Assam situation. So in Assam, the situation is volatile because of the NRC, National Register of Citizens preparation, which is going on presently. So here there are these ethnic communities who are demanding ST status, like these Koch, Rajbongshi, Taj Ahom, Moran, Muttok, Chutia, Adivasi, Tea Garden communities. So these are also demanding themselves ST status. Then there is this Bodoland demanding organizations of Bodoland, a separate nation for themselves. That is another issue. Also, Adivasis in Assam, Rajbo, Koch, Rajabongshi issues, they are demanding the Assam Accord to be implemented. So all these are making the situation volatile in Assam. And presently, the Home Minister of India has been called to review the security situation along with the Chief Minister of Assam as well. So this has taken place. There's also a demand for trilateral meeting to take place among these communities, representatives, of course, and the Assam government and the central government. So that is here the key issue. So this Assam issue basically is because of outsiders, that outsiders are coming and settling in, in Assam because of which the demographic is changing. And basically, they have problem with Bangladeshi nationals too and nationals from other countries. The next news item is Gopalpur becomes a canvas for murals. So Gopalpur is in Ganjam district in Odisha. It's a, it's a beach resort. So here the old walls have got an artistic look, look now. So there are murals. Murals basically means paintings made on walls. They were you know, ancient murals also paintings which we know they were done on caves. Then there were these paintings done on palace walls also so these murals such murals have been made by present artists artists in gopalpur so they have used the famous bagnach which is a tiger dance which is famous of this ganjam district of Odisha. so you should know this from culture perspective that bag dance is from Odisha. then flexible brass metal fish the artistic ganjapa playing cards so all these have been shown in these mural paintings the silk weaving tradition is shown even the cyclone file in Cyclone, cyclone of 2013 which devastated Orisha coast here is also shown in this mural paintings. So that is in use. So mural paintings looking at the culture perspective to the Ajanta Elora paintings are known. This is the Padmapani and Vajrapani. The Ajanta Elora paintings are known for Buddhist uh, theme paintings. Then there is Bagh Caves in Madhya Pradesh which has mural paintings. Vadami Caves of Karnataka. Sita Manavassal. This in Tamil Nadu is also known by its paintings. And this is paintings which have lotus been depicted in them, on them. So this is important. They show lotus. Then these are Alchi and Himis monasteries. In this are in Ladakh. So there, here also there are these paintings. You can see here. Arunachal Pradesh, Tripura also have paintings. Himachal Pradesh has this Tabo monastery in Spiti Valley. Here also there are these paintings which are shown. So these are mural paintings. Then we had even during the medieval times, during the time of Akbar and Jahangir, the palace walls were painted, fort walls were painted and Mughal paintings also inspired Rajput paintings. So Rajput paintings are also there. Then Kerala murals which are there, these are on the walls of temples and monuments. They have traces of European affinity too. So this you can see a little modernization and European influence in painting was seen in these murals. Then the next news item is India safe but can do more for tourists. So this is the viewpoint of UNWTO. So this is not World Trade Organization. This is UN World Tourism Organization. This is headquartered in Madrid in Spain. So this is body responsible for promoting sustainable, responsible, universally accessible tourism. And it says India is safe country for tourists. So this is important. They, they are recommending that branding of tourism in the country and hassle-free visa facilitation will further increase tourism into the country. They also say that social media these days play a vital role. So tourism promotion through that should also be emphasized on. And 2017 has been observed as International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development. So this UNWTO is also bringing out a report on contribution of tourism to development and relation between tourism and sustainable development goals, the SDGs which have been proposed at UN to be achieved by 2030. So they will bring out a report on this too. 
Then the next news item is sharp rise in forest fires as summer advances in Odisha. So Odisha government has developed an SOP, standard operating procedure to prevent forest fires. Despite that, many forest fires have been detected through satellite images in Odisha. In the month of March itself, 1,607 forest fire instances have been recorded. So there is an increase of 57% in number of forest fires corresponding to last year's data. So this is important from disaster management perspective to say destroy forest. Forest fires results in a huge loss to the ecology and environment. So forest department has also proposed that they wish to have a 20,000 kilometer long fire line so that fire can be stopped from spreading to large areas. So this is a proposal which has been put forth has to be implemented. Fire fighting squads are already in place. So they have been created, still it's not sufficient. And also fire blowers have been for the first time being supplied to forest division to control fire, to fire blowers. So this is with respect to forest fires. The next news item is Uttarakhand government to ensure safety of Corbett Park wildlife. So in Corbett Park wildlife, there is a proposal which has been accepted for the construction of Kandi Road. So this Kandi Road will pass through Corbett National Park and it will reduce the distance between Garhwal and Kumau, so it is Uttarakhand by about 70 kilometers. So public works department has been ordered by the Supreme Court that Uttarakhand government, the Uttarakhand government's department has to prepare a new alignment project for the project so that the wildlife here will not be affected. So the Uttarakhand government has said that it will ensure wildlife of Corbett National Park is not affected by this Kandri road which will be constructed. Then the next news item is why lawyers go on strike. So this is the law commission report, 266 report. We have discussed earlier to a law commission report. By, it was headed by former Supreme Court Judge Justice Balbir Singh Chauhan. So in this 266 report now, the next one he is talking about how lawyers protesting and going on strike is resulting in loss to the number of work days work hours for the courts and also it has proposed an amendment bill to advocates act of 1961 to tighten the government's control over lawyers so it gives examples too that kavi sammelan shrad heavy rains moral support to social activists earthquake in nepal bomb blast in pakistan school these have been the reasons for lawyers to go on strike in the country in the past five years so that is why action now needs to be taken against unruly behavior of advocates, their conduct in courts, so their unprofessional conduct is talking of the end. So how they use strike as a measure of protest. So this has reached terrifying proportions, it says, and thereby, that is why this amendment has been proposed to the advocates. Then the next news item is India to redefine blindness. So India has blindness been defined as a person, a person is blind if he is unable to count fingers from a distance of 6 meters. So that is the definition of blindness in India. But World Health Organization's definition is a person who is unable to count fingers from a distance of 3 meters. So India's definition is actually making it broader. So the number of blind counting will be more in this case. So now the government has changed this definition which is four decades old 40 years old that now it has come to meet the global estimates uh, norms that is who norm so now it will also india will also take it from a distance of three meters only so it, it, the number of blind would also come down because of this so this definition has been changed under the national program for control of blindness then the next news item is many parties against no dues certificates so the election commission has actually presently sought the views of various political parties that all the people who are going to fight elections so they have to submit these no dues certificates so these no dues certificates means that they have no dues pending to various government utilities like you know for electricity for power for water supply so all these agencies they have to furnish certificates from these agencies that they have no dues pending so actually the election commission had used this in the present assembly elections in these five states too that those who are filing nomination papers if they don't furnish no dues certificates their nomination papers could not be filed so that's what it says that even the commission has said that delhi high court had directed so in august 2015 that furnishing such no dues certificates should be done so it's citing that court directive also. Then the next news item is 
India eyes Dhruv's foreign market. So Dhruv is the advanced light helicopter of the country which has been indigenously built and now we are looking at exporting it to friendly countries. So we are in discussion with Sri Lanka and other Southeast Asian nations for supplying Dhruv the advanced light helicopter to them. So now emphasis is also being put on maintenance and training because I experience with Ecuador, a South American country was not good because actually this deal was signed with Ecuador in 2009 that seven Ecuador helicopters would be supplied to it but then four of them crashed and because of this Ecuador unilaterally terminated the contract in 2016. So, in 2015 and in 2016, the three helicopters which it had were put on sale. So, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited moved to the local court in Ecuador too and it proved that of the four crashes, two were attributed to pilot error and one was mechanical failure. So, this was the status in Ecuador too. So, now we are looking at sale to other countries. Dhruv has been designed and developed by HAL. The engine which it uses is Shakti engine. So, this has been jointly developed by Hall and Turbomaker of France. So, this is regarding Dhruv. The details are given here. You can see military use of it is being done presently in India, Israel, Maldives, Mauritius, Nepal, Suriname and of course Ecuador which contract, nominated the contract unilaterally. Also for civil use, it is used in India as well as in Turkey and Peru. So that is there. So it has, you can see the weapons which it has are these anti-armor missiles, air-to-air -air missiles which it carries. Also naval variants are being developed. So they have torpedoes and anti-ship missiles. Then the next news item is how many Indians have access to internet? So this figure which has come from TRI, so Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, it has these quarterly performance indicators reports. In its latest report, it says that India had 36.74 crores internet subscribers in September 2016. So, means out of 127.7 crore population of the country, 36.74 crore are internet, are internet subscribers. So, this actually comes to around 28.77% of internet subscribers. But then the, the article here says that this data which it came up is number of internet subscriptions. So this cannot be translated to number of internet subscribers. So that is why because in urban areas you see that mobile phones also have internet then you have Wi-Fi connection. So there will be multiple number of times that the, you know, this calculation is done. So rather than seeing number of individuals, number of households with internet as such should be seen. So in that case you will have an undue bend towards urban in India. So that's what it says that it also try data also says that urban India has 61.9 internet subscriptions per 100 people and rural India has just 13.7. So this clearly states the fact rather than considering this figure that 28.77 percent of India has our you know, our internet subscribers. So that's what this a whole article is emphasizing on that uh, you should see at the whole picture and rural India is still lagging behind and the digital divide does exist. So that's what it says. Then of course the other question is the internet connections being there to the quality of internet connection, the power supply which is there in remote areas. So that all aspect infrastructure is also important. And of course it emphasizes that the Bharatnet project which India has uh, initiated. So under USOF2. Universal Service Obligation Fund is also used for funding this Bharatnet project. We have done this earlier too about connecting 2.5 lakh gram panchayats with internet connectivity. So this is again has to be emphasized on and it also says that many mobile phones use older technology, snail pace 2G technology. So that is also there. So, so this all these aspects are also there highlighting the digital divide. So this is given here. Then the next news item is airfares set to rise as center hikes airport charges. So the central government has decided to raise the airport charges across all non-major airports. So major airports are Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, Chennai. So these are, non -ma these are major. So not the major but the non-major airports will have their airport charges raised by 5%. So these non-major airports are operated by Airport Authority of India and the major airports are actually operated by Airports Economic Regulatory Authority. So they fix the fees for major airports and non-major is done by government through this AAI. 
so this has been the announcement done now so also the passenger service fee has been increased so this increase means passenger service fee is a fees which is taken for providing services to passengers like baggage trolleys escalators air conditioning conveyor belt system for baggages wi-fi system etc so all this is also charged so that is the passenger service fee that will also increase plus civil aviation ministry has also increased landing parking parking and route navigation charges for all aai airports by five percent so this will take place every year so of course this will also be going back to the customers only the flyers so this will result in increase in the airfare airfares as such so that is there also it says that user development fee at some airports here has also been raised by the government so at one thing it says under regional connectivity scheme that it wants to bring airfares down and then by these service fees etc been increased charges increase the airfares are bound to rise as well then the next news item is infrastructure clouds connectivity so this is regarding the ministry of civil aviation now being close to award the regional connectivity schemes routes so routes will be allocated to various air service operators but this study by chrysal research says that only about 60 percent of these one 414 identified unserved and underserved regional airports have the necessary infrastructure to support flight operations so even if they're uh, handed over what is given for this regional connectivity routes to various air service operators but if the infrastructure is not there at these unserved underserved airports how will they function because here even to break even it says that they will require at least passenger load factor of 50 to 60 percent so then that's what it is throwing a, a uh, you know, it's difficult to say that whether regional connectivity scheme would be successful or not under this situation when infrastructure is not available. So that's what it says that viability gap funding has to be emphasized on. So even domestic passenger traffic in the country is increasing, but of course the concentration is on six metro airports which the country has. They account for about 65% of total domestic passenger traffic. So of course regional connectivity scheme was in the right direction but then in its implementation the questions are being raised here that how will it be functional because unless and until they don't break even these air operator air service operators then they will not be going ahead and because in these unserved underserved areas even the flights which will be taken will be, will be of lesser passenger capacity so these smaller aircrafts will be costlier also so that also has to be taken into consideration so that's what counter bidding counter bidding has been done and awarding of these routes will shortly be announced so they will the selected airlines will receive these routes exclusively for three years for commencing operations so they have to make sure that the airfare charges are kept as per the government's uh, you know, idea that they should be fixed at 2500 per, per you know distance which has been decided that is one hour for one hour flight 2500 rupees so now how will they be able to because whatever gap will be there that would be provided for by the government subsidies would be provided by the government so this who will be these airlines who will be functioning on these unserved underserved routes this has been awarded through this bidding but then the question is that if these airports will not be able to function then how will these airlines be benefited rather they would be suffering because of infrastructure not being present so that is highlighted also it's talking about greenfield airport so greenfield means an airport which has been newly established from scratch brownfield means originally an airport is there which is not functional has not the necessary infrastructure and that necessary infrastructure is put up and the airport becomes functional so that is called brownfield project so this is a greenfield airport also in durgapur in west bengal which is built with 100 percent private capital this is also struggling to attract commercial airline operators now so this has been highlighted in Durgapur. Even Reliance has invested in regional airports in Maharashtra, but they have not yet performed. So this ILNFS also has interest in Karnataka developing a regional airport. So this aspect is also highlighted. So how regional connectivity scheme would succeed. Then the next news item is power losses, technology to the rescue. So in India, power sector sees a lot of TND losses. So TND stands for transmission and distribution losses. So they account for about 60% of the losses. So it's very high. So how to reduce this transmission and distribution losses? So there are technical reasons for these losses too and also non-technical reasons. And non-technical reasons are stealing of power. 
so the the government now proposes to use technology so technology will be it will be used here will be sensors would be placed as such so these will use gsm technology and they will transmit the data regarding the usage to distribution companies central server so the server will get all this information if anything is wrong then it will get the necessary details so india has around 4 lakh kilometers of distribution lines power distribution lines so that's why what is important of course for this is that there needs to be an effective reliable and secure communication system so even customers they should have these smart meters so smart meters will have to be you know readily able to provide this communication directly there will be a chip here but then here a concern is with smart meters that if there are tough locations like basements etc then reliable communication line getting it would be difficult but that's what the so modern technology also has to come in even 5g or internet of things as we call it that everything is connected through this technology communication systems so if this develops then this uh, sensors what is provision has be, to be made that sensors using gsm technology can transmit data about any technical losses to non technical losses to so if there is a fault so that also can be easily informed to to the distribution company server and action can be taken immediately so this is use of technology to reduce losses and the last news item is google to bring artificial intelligence into daily life so google so the technology giant of google here the name of the company is alphabet inc so it is now planning to democratize artificial intelligence means bring in artificial intelligence to the common people so that machine learning or artificial intelligence basically how machine learning results in they being able to think for themselves like humans so that you know these applications can be available to everybody users developers various enterprises so they can help in detecting deadly diseases managing them even reducing accident risks etc discovering financial frauds also is possible so what is it all about is that machines learn so what technique google uses here is deep learning so deep learning means it is provided with large amount of information the system as such a machine is provided with this large amount of information and then it is taught to search for patterns using this technique deep learning technique so then when it has to take action or decisions it has to bring out things it can easily pick up and decide so that is called artificial intelligence thinking for itself so this is been developed by google now so that is it thank you